Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. We are delighted you could join us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. Hypertension or raised blood pressure is a serious medical condition that significantly increases the risks of heart, brain and other diseases. According to the World Health Organization, worldwide about 1.28 billion adults between ages 30 and 79 have hypertension. That's a sixth of the world's population. Approximately 46% of adults with hypertension are unaware that they have the condition. Not up to 50% with hypertension are diagnosed and treated. And only one in five have it under control. But hypertension can be detected and controlled. With the global target to reduce, will the global target to reduce the prevalence of hypertension by 33% in 2030 be achieved? Joining me from our Abuja studio is a consultant physician at the National Hospital Abuja, Dr. Ogugwa Osiobu. You're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, Mary. It's called a silent killer because uh, there are usually no symptoms. But when there are symptoms, what are they? Right, so we, it's, I mean, like you right, rightly said, high blood pressure is described as a silent killer because often there are no symptoms. Um, really, that's basically it. There are often no symptoms. For those who have hypertension that is secondary, so we, we classify hypertension into uh, primary, meaning we have no known cause, uh, and secondary, and 85 to 90% of cases of hypertension are actually the primary type, where we do not um, discover any known cause. And another 5 to 10% uh, fall under the secondary type, meaning there will be uh, known causes for the hypertension. So, and these causes range from kidney disease, uh, diseases involving a particular gland in the, in the abdomen that we describe as the adrenal gland, uh, um, use of uh, certain medications, particularly women who use um, in, who use uh, family um, family uh, what do we call them now? Who use drugs, um, you know, for prevention of pregnancy, and if they use this for a prolonged period of time, uh, they can actually develop high blood pressure. So those are the secondary types. Often the secondary types will have symptoms. So if you have kidney disease. Your eyes might, uh, you know, be puffy in the mornings. Uh, you might have leg swelling. Um, if you have the problems of the adrenal gland, you might have abdominal uh, pain, you know, pain in your uh, belly uh, or even swelling. So those that have the secondary type tend to have uh, symptoms. Often the primary uh, symptom less until they develop complications. So when you now develop heart disease, from your hypertension, you might get easily tired, you take a short walk and you feel like you've been running a marathon, um, you might have leg swelling, you might not be able to sleep, lie on one pillow at night and be comfortable, you know, you're not comfortable until you elevate your head on two or three pillows. Those are people that are already developing some problems with the heart from the hypertension. Do we know the cause of primary hypertension? Are there causes? Well, so uh, there are risk factors. Uh, so that's why we describe it as uh, primary, the fact that we do not, we cannot really lay our hands on any uh, particular causes, but there are risk factors. And those risk factors can be uh, classified into the modifiable risk factors, meaning you can do something about them, and the non-modifiable. So when we talk about the non-modifiable risk factors, the age. So increasing age is a big risk factor for hypertension. My cohort of patients, the geriatric patients, are at a much higher risk. And in the clinic, we see three out of four of our patients having hypertension. So that's a major risk factor, the uh, age. So those 60 and above are really high risk of developing hypertension. Uh, family history. Um, the type of genes that you have acquired, 
or inherited rather from yeah. you know from your um, parent also increases that you know it's one of the non modified we really can't do anything about that and if you already have established uh, chronic medical conditions that put you at risk of hypertension so those who have the kidney diseases diabetes who are at risk again we can really stretch the point that those can be modified because you can manage those conditions. But when we now come to the modifiable risk factors, uh, which is really important, and, and you know, that's uh, where a lot of our audience really need to pay attention, um, being overweight or obese is a big risk factor. Um, having you know, a diet being unhealthy, where you're eating a lot of um, uh, calories from fats, uh, from carbohydrates, and gaining an excessive amount of weight, the risk factor where your diet is uh, so high in sodium, it's a big risk factor, where your physical activity level is low. Um, so we need people to move. You must put um, exercise in, you know, exercise and physical activity must be a way of life for each and every one of us uh, because physical inactivity is a major risk factor uh, for developing high blood pressure high consumption of alcohol, tobacco use, and all of this are modifiable. Uh, so okay. these are uh, the modifiable risks that people must look into, um, pay attention to, and intervene upon. So that let me ask you, let me ask you a question, over. jumping off from your answer. There's this talk about trans fats. How does a person, a regular person, recognize trans fats? What are trans fats? To a lot of people, it's just a word. So they are to avoid trans fats, but how? Right, so the trans fats are, well, really bad source of fats in our diet. And what they do is they increase the level of, when we look at cholesterol in the, in the, in the body, there are cholesterol fractions that are good, and we call that the high-density lipoprotein, and the very poor uh, cholesterol that increases risk for heart diseases and, and, and stroke, uh, we call that the low-density lipoprotein. So what ha happens, the trans fats will tend to increase the level of the low-density lipoprotein, which is a really bad cholesterol, that would then increase the risk for those uh, cardiovascular conditions, heart attack, um, stroke, uh, risk of uh, having losing a limb from not having adequate blood flow to your uh, to the extremities. So, trans fats we find there are naturally occurring trans fats and there are artificial trans fats. The naturally occurring ones we find, you know, in beef, um, in lamb, so in animal sources of proteins. Okay. Um, and the artificially occurring trans fats we find in, you know, in processed food, particularly fried food. So your fried you know, potatoes, you know, French fries, uh, popcorn that you have, to, you pop into the uh, in the microwave to pop, uh, cakes. So all of those things that, that are ten, that are baked, um, and they've used um, oil, um, have a very high content of trans fats. And as we intensify efforts to make our diet healthier, we really should try and avoid um, trans fat containing foods. The other source for us, you know, uh, around this part of the world is reusing oil. So every time we, we uh, every time oil is fried, there's the hydrogenation process that increases the trans fat level. And so it's recommended that you do not reuse oil um, a professor out of uh, Calabar actually did a study where uh, she recommended that if you had to reuse your oil, uh, put some onions in it, and it might reduce that process of hydrogenation uh, and, and risk of increasing trans fat level. Oh, that, that's, that's a new one. We'll take that on board about the onions. Yeah. Now, um, some people have a high pressure reading. They have a high pressure reading today. Tomorrow, the pressure reading is normal. And they say, okay, you are not hypertensive. What needs to happen for you to diagnose someone as hypertensive? 
Right, so we look at the numbers. We say we want normal blood pressure should, when we measure blood pressure, there are two values. The upper value, which we describe as systolic blood pressure, and the lower one, the diastolic. So we want the systolic blood pressure to be below 120 millimeters of mercury and the diastolic to be below 80 millimeters of mercury. So if uh, an adult has uh, blood pressure reading below that, we say that you're normotensive. Uh, if you have a reading between systolic going from 120 to 129 uh, or, and or diastolic going from 80 to 89, we say you have pre-hypertension. And uh, the reason we make that distinction is at that level or at those levels, you, we, there's really no recommendation for the use of pharmacological agents or medications. But lifestyle uh, modification is required at that, in that stage. And if you now have systolic blood pressure going uh, 140 and above or diastolic going 90 and above, then we say that you actually have um, you know, defined or established hypertension. And, and oh. what happens is sometimes, you know, you meet someone today and blood pressure is 150 over 90, and they say, oh, no, doctor, you know, but I'm not hypertensive. There are ways, there are things that we look at uh, during the clinical exam that would tell us that this high blood pressure has actually existed for longer, that it's not something that just came about uh, a week or two weeks ago. And that's what, you know, uh, we then used to have that conversation to say, oh, yes, you think uh, you haven't had high blood pressure. It's probably because you've never been in the habit of actually going in to have a check. But from this signs that we're seeing, uh, it tells us that your blood pressure has existed for much longer. And, and that, those signs then give us the impetus to say, oh, this person definitely needs uh, to be on treatment to control the blood pressure, in addition to the lifestyle changes that we would recommend. This year's theme, you know, measure your blood pressure, control it, measure your blood pressure accurately, control it, and uh, live longer. It's all about awareness and all that. And they say every time you walk into the hospital, please take a blood pressure reading, you know. But some people, don't get to the, see the inside of a hospital six months, sometimes a year, because they don't get sick. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing about this? What do you recommend? Since we're trying to get those people who don't even know they have high blood pressure. Right, well, one of, uh, I must commend you and channels for doing this, uh, raising awareness. We really must keep talking about it. Uh, and maybe having um, boats at the marketplaces where we know that we have a large pool of uh, people just gather. So both the vendors who are selling and those who come to the market to buy can have an opportunity to have a blood pressure check. But really, uh, Mary, what it is is that everyone must make it a way of life to get a blood pressure check once a year. Or, or let me put it as, get a medical check once a year, a well check. Or meaning we don't always have to only wait until we have um, problems. You know, you have a headache or um, a cough before you decide to go into a hospital. And what I recommend is we should all give it to ourselves as a, a birthday gift. So a week to your birthday, go into uh, uh, the, the hospital, the doctor's office, and that really brings me also to the issue of identifying a general practitioner. Uh, that, that's something that we, is not common around here, but everyone really should have a doctor that you know, has their history and you keep going back there uh, once a year and in between if, if there are um, other issues. And that way you can actually track your numbers. That's right. We talk about people knowing their numbers and tracking it. So your blood pressure this year is 110, over 70, it's great. Uh, two, three years down the line, you're reading 130 over 80. Sounding like it's normal, but that's a big jump from your normal uh, value. So that tracking also helps you, or helps you know, the patient and the caregivers or the uh, healthcare workers to actually 
be more intentional about making sure that that blood pressure comes back to normal. All right, so that we has all been... must uh, identify a general practitioner. We also must go in for annual well checks to be able to track those numbers. Thank you so much. That has been so good. We still have some of our time left, but we're going on a break. When we come back, we continue. Please stay with us. Welcome back. We're still talking about hypertension on health matters, and that's on channels television. We are still talking with Dr. Ogugwa Usiobu. Now, doctor, let's go back to the discussion. I love what you said about the general practitioner, by the way, but we'll talk about that some other time. Um, some people say, look, you run around too much. You're always up, down, and everywhere. That's why your blood pressure is up. Is there any truth to that statement? Right, so um, I guess they're trying to link stress to uh, blood pressure elevation. For those who have already established uh, blood pressure and undergo undue stress, that could increase the risk, uh, particularly of the systolic blood pressure going uh, even higher. Uh, we know that persistent or chronic stressful uh, situation can increase certain hormones in the, in the body, uh, hormone levels in the body, cortisol, um, adrenaline, and all of those could cause transient um, blood pressure elevations. Uh, but unless this is, you know, a, a chronic thing that one is, in, you know, uh, immersed in for months, then there could be a contribution to uh, uh, developing high blood pressure. The other thing that people tend to talk about is, oh, uh, my blood pressure is high today because I didn't sleep well. Again, um, that being a stressor, those are transient uh, elevations in blood pressure and might not necessarily remain um, permanent. But for someone who has established hypertension, we do know that those uh, stressful situations do increase, particularly the systolic blood pressure levels. Okay. Um, do you think that for these, you know, you have these uh, range of blood pressure that you call normal. Is it possible for some people that their normal should be lower, especially for pregnant women? Like, some people say, okay, you say 120, 80 is normal. But for me, I begin to feel funny when I have 120, 80. Is that possible? Remember I mentioned it earlier, that, you know, someone who's 110, 70, and then two years down the line, they become 130, 80, that's a big jump. So what we're looking for is a value below 120, systolic, a value below 80, uh, diastolic. People will tend to become uh, symptomatic when, again, the systolic is below 100. So we're looking for uh, systolic between 100 to 120 and diastolic between 60 to 80 to, um, uh, that we describe as normotensive. So when your diastolic is going below 60, you're already becoming hypotensive. If your uh, systolic is going below 100, uh, we also describe that as hypotension, and people actually might feel dizzy. Um, uh, older adults might actually start, you know, having repeated falls when they have those very low blood pressure. So, yes, we're not saying everybody must be at the, at the ceiling, 120, 80, but we're looking at values below 120, 80, uh, and, of course, above 100 or 60, uh, and that's that normal tensive range. So we, we're all constitutionally made uh, different. So the, there'll, there'll be people, you okay, know, running yeah. different values within that range or within those ranges. The theme, you know, contains the word accurately. Measure your blood pressure accurately. And I'm sure that wasn't put there by mistake. So is inaccurate measurement a problem? Has it been a problem? And why? 
Right. Very, 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 very important question. So there are, when we measure, there are set conditions that should be met when blood pressure is to be measured. Um, you should be um, comfortably seated, uh, just like I'm seated right now. Um, your feet should be placed flat on the floor. Uh, and you've been in that uh, comfortable sitting for about two minutes. So we don't want someone walking from the street, uh, sweaty, you know, just that stress of uh, that walk. And we don't know how long your walk has been or you've been in traffic. Say you live in Lagos, you've been in traffic for three, four hours. You know, uh, you get to the doctor's clinic and that minute that you get there, we're checking your blood pressure. We're not likely to, you know, we're likely to get uh, blood pressure that's affected by just that activity and the stress of it that you have been through in the previous three to four hours. So we want for blood pressure reading, you're comfortably seated, feet placed flat on the, on the floor, uh, and you, you're in that comfortable position for at least two minutes before uh, we check the reading. The second is the cough size. So when we're measuring blood pressure, because people come in different sizes, you need to make sure that you're using an appropriate size an appropriate size cough, otherwise the readings can actually be skewed. So if you use a large cough size for somebody who's smaller, you might get an inaccurately lower uh, blood pressure reading. If you use a small size cough for a much bigger person, you might get an inaccurately um, um, lower reading uh, for such. So we must make sure that cough size is appropriate while measuring blood pressure. Sometimes, too, some of the, um, the digital um, equipments that we have now uh, are actually not as accurate as others. And so uh, we would typically say to our clients in the hospital, bring your device to the clinic so we can compare. Uh, we, we tend to have more accurate readings when we use the manual sphygmometers. Uh, but, uh, so when we compare our readings with the manual sphyg with the digital uh, equipment, then we, we can uh, typically say whether that digital device is actually giving uh, accurate readings or not. So these are some of the reasons why um, blood pressure readings might not be accurate. I found that as the Electronic devices usually have a lower reading than the sphygmometer. But what you're saying really gives me a lot of confidence. So do we now advise patients that when they get their uh, electronic device, they should definitely visit their doctor? And then that again brings up the issue of having a family doctor, somebody who knows you, who has your history, you know, it's, it's so important. Uh, I, I understand your concern. I, I have that concern too. Absolutely right. Uh, the same thing even with the blood sugar uh, equipment. You must come in and make sure that it's, uh, it, it, it actually will be giving you the appropriate reading. There is a calibration that is required, particularly for the blood pressure uh, equipment. But for those uh, electronic blood pressure devices, Really, they come in, they're those that are wristbands, there are the ones that you can put on your arm. Uh, so it's important that uh, you find a way to uh, cross-check that actually it's giving you accurate readings. And that can happen by bringing it to the uh, doctor's office. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogugwa Osiobu. That was a wonderful talk. I, I, I know you've been busy. So I'm thanking you from the bottom of my heart. Have a lovely day. And thank you, viewers, for being there with us to go through this topic. Have a wonderful day. I am Mary Alaleyusu.